So our, our next speaker is Miguel Sena Estevez from UMass Medical School, and the um, title of his uh, presentation is AV Gene Therapy to the CNS, Past, Present, and Future. All right, first of all, well, thank you for the invitation to, to speak to you today, despite being the 8 a.m. Uh, session. I actually thought this was going to be the friends and family uh, meeting with everybody still asleep. Uh, for those of you that have enjoyed the live streaming in the morning at 8 a.m., like I have a few times, Advil and water cures everything. Later on, you'll be perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, where, oh, this is the changer, okay. So this is my disclosure. Um, and the next slide really is a, a, a 2 a.m. thought that perhaps, not entirely sure that's, that's a good thought, but this is sort of what I started thinking about at 2 a.m., bit of a strange thought, and I guess it pegs me as a, a geek of, of flight, I suppose. Um, and in a bit of a reductionist view of, of where the field of CNS gene therapy has been and, and where it's going, but uh, for, for a long time, uh, because of the, the flimsy but highly effective blood-brain barrier, uh, we've been stuck in, in sort of what I call the trepanation age, which sort of a little bit of joke about neuros, uh, neurosurgeons, I suppose. Um, and of course, while uh, before we, we tried to do the, take the bad spirits out, actually we now tried to put in uh, uh, curative genes and, and been very successful, and we've had uh, several examples of that, that even though uh, it's an injection into the brain, we've seen uh, transformative outcomes in children effective, uh, effective with AADC deficiency, as well as very promising results in Parkinson's disease as well. So while uh, we all realize that this is a, um, not the ideal scenario because uh, it's easy to understand that uh, the, the blood delivery through the bloodstream, considering that every neuron is less than a micron away from a blood vessel, is certainly the ideal scenario, except that uh, the blood-brain barrier is a highly effective uh, physiology, physiological barrier. So uh, Kevin Faust and Brian Casper, you know, the thought I had last night is that unlike the Wright brothers that flew for the first time about 100 feet and transformed uh, worldwide travel, uh, they actually took flight in 2009 and, and, and never quite stopped and continued to fly. And last year, I think we were all very impressed with the results in SMA uh, having an absolutely transformative outcome. And so this is sort of, uh, but we also recognize that AV9 has, uh, has its uh, limitations. And while it worked extremely well for uh, SMA, uh, the transduction in adults of neurons is relatively small. Now comes along uh, Ben Dieverman and Viviana Gradnaro with uh, a different approach of selection. Again, as, as Shannon mentioned, sort of throw the pasta at the wall and whatever sticks um, is great. But actually at the very end, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the, 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 the advancement that this represents beyond the fact that it has shown us that it's possible to achieve very high efficiency gene delivery uh, to, the central, to the adult central nervous system. So what I'm going to tell you today is uh, the view uh, of, the, of the field from the lens of a person that works on lysosomal storage diseases and sort of the challenges that we encountered and the lessons that we've learned in the process that I think apply to the central nervous system, uh, perhaps uh, neurons by its nature of not being, um, not regenerating, have a toxic insult. Uh, it's a little bit more uh, evident, um, some of the limitations that we found but perhaps it's something that can inform uh, other safety uh, concerns that have been found uh, recently. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, we started a lot of our work uh, at the age of trepanation, I suppose, where it's based on uh, injections, intracranial injections. And as the discovery was made of AV9 that can actually cross the blood brain barrier and the realization that some of the new uh, capsules can actually distribute through CSF as well, our work has also evolved in that direction of taking advantage of the new technological uh, improvements. So my work has been uh, based on, sorry about that, uh, lysosomal storage diseases that affect the central nervous system, uh, often consider the, the low-hanging fruit in the neurological uh, diseases uh, for uh, various reasons. Amongst them, of course, is the, the clear correlation between uh, mutations uh, and phenotypes and monogenetic diseases. So certainly from the point of view of the molecular phenotypes, 
there is still some questions of how exactly uh, the uh, accumulated substrates trigger neurodegeneration, but from the point of view of understanding how to intervene in these diseases, it's certainly one of the simpler, uh, is a group of one of the simplest ones, and of course certainly it affects children uh, and com uh, as globally as a group of diseases certainly has a high frequency, but each one individually is extremely rare. So the reason I work on it is because most, the, the vast majority of them actually have some form or another that affect the central nervous system and hence the, the interest in developing therapy. So in particular, I work on ganglicidosis, so GM1 ganglicidosis and Tay-Sachs disease and Senhoff caused by deficiencies in the uh, lysomal beta galactosidase, uh, GM1 ganglicidosis, and Tay-Sachs and Senhoff by deficiencies in exosaminidase A. Uh, the biochemistry is relatively simple, accumulation of GM1 ganglicide, hence the name, or GM2 ganglicide in the CNS, and both of them present infantile, juvenile, and adult onset forms, and not surprisingly for the infantile forms, the disease progresses very rapidly, and within a year, um, kids have lost many of the developmental milestones that have acquired, some of them actually never even acquire them, so these are very uh, severe diseases. So uh, the reason actually uh, lysomal storage disease are considered sort of the low-hanging fruit in the neurodegenerative field of neurological disease is by two simple facts that actually are the, the basis for um, some of the biotech companies that have been extremely su successful over the last 40 years. One of them is that if you overexpress these proteins in a cell, instead of degrading the proteins, the cells for whatever reason actually pump it out uh, into the extracellular space. And for, again, for whatever mechanism and for whatever biological reason that we don't necessarily know, uh, cells do have mannose-6-phosphate receptors on their surface that allows you to target these proteins uh, specifically to the lysosome where they become active and degrade the substrates that are accumulated. What this means is two things. First of all, that Genzyme was possible 50 years ago or 40 years ago uh, by providing enzyme, a recombinant enzyme, and establishing the first path towards enzyme replacement therapy that has Sarri-Gaucher disease and then expanded to a number of the other diseases. But what it also means from the point of gene therapy is that we actually don't need to modify every single cell in the brain or elsewhere in the body to actually achieve a therapeutic effect. So in fact, uh, the vectors that we have presently are perfectly fine uh, to accomplish that goal. Now, the surprising part is that uh, as much as it is considered the low-hanging fruit of the neurological diseases, the therapeutic effects in clinical trials have been a little short of what we've been able to accomplish in, in, clinical, in, in animal models. I have to tell you, I do not have the answer why that is the case, uh, but hopefully uh, we'll get uh, better results soon. So uh, one of the things that intuitively for a protein that is secreted, uh, one can understand and expect is that for any entity that is secreted to a fluid, is that there is a gradient of, of diffusion from the source of the enzyme that would be the transient cell and move out, and of course the concentration would be expected to be uh, lower as you go further away from the source. So if, if this is the principle of therapy that one could exploit uh, for uh, intraprenchymal delivery, as you can imagine, to treat a mouse, perhaps a couple of injections would be sufficient. However, as you go from a mouse to a human, well, if you scale up based on brain weight, well, you know, a couple hundred injections might be necessary to do that. Fortunately enough, again, for biological reasons that we don't really understand, is that lysosomal enzymes can actually be transported through axonal transport, okay? And uh, the reason for that is unclear, but we found this uh, serendipitously in the lab many years ago. And in fact, a single injection into the thalamus, uh, which is about here, and here, so it expands, it's a deep brain structure that is highly interconnected in the brain. Uh, in fact, you can actually deliver enzyme throughout the entire hemisphere. Uh, so the importance of that means that you no longer have to do a thousand injections, but in fact, if you choose your targets carefully based on the axonal connectivity, you can actually compensate for the fact that intraprenchymal injections, of course, do not distribute very widely. Certainly, there's been many improvements in the injection technology from, for instance, Chris Bankowitz with convection enhanced delivery, but that only gets you so far. So we, our lab and many others have found other structures. Now, why does the thalamus work in this manner? So 
When we found this, of course, this was a surprise. The first time we saw it, we were a bit surprised that this was the result. Obviously pretty happy because a single injection treated the entire brain, and the blue just means enzymatic activity. Um, the fact of the matter is that thalamus is sort of the relay of information of the entire brain. So pretty much it's connected to every single other structure in the brain and receives the sensory information before sending it to the cortex. So this has implications both from a therapeutic point of view as a target for deliver gene delivery, but it also has importance when you consider the therapeutic uh, interventions uh, that are being considered and whether you treat that structure or not is, I believe it's critical, given that it's the relay of information in the brain. So using this approach, we two bilateral injections, and this is a biochemistry showing it here in untreated animals in the, in the cortex, that lots of uh, gangliocide is accumulated uh, in the CNS, in adult animals, and upon, tre upon treatment within a month, you correct uh, back to normal levels, and in fact, over time, out to a year, uh, those levels remain uh, relatively stable and close to uh, normal levels. However, one of the things that we also found is that, in fact, um, treatment of the, of the cerebellum and of the spinal cord is imperfect with thalamic injections alone, and therefore other uh, targets are necessary. So uh, the principle here in this first stage of, of approach that we want to do with intracranial injections, again, the notion is that you create this nucleus or this uh, center or enzyme donor center that because of its axonal connectivity as well as secretion into the interstitial fluid it can actually distribute enzyme uh, throughout the entire brain. So as I mentioned before, you know, accomplishing this in a mouse is relatively trivial. Mouse brain is small. I suppose you know, we've made progress enough to say nowadays that treating a mouse is, is actually trivial, so we've come a long way even there. And usually you show the brain here to just show that you know, the complexity of the brain and the, you know, the size of the cortex itself is, is dramatically different. And then you know, we point out down here to the, the difference in, in brain weight. But in fact, if you scale that, you, you really understand a little bit more the challenge that is going from this into a human. So one of the approaches that we've taken is, is use an intermediate model and ask the question of, is the biology the same that we document in mice, and can we achieve the transformative results that we can in a mouse uh, do that in a larger animal as well. So, in fact, when we've done this uh, in a naturally occurring cat model of GM1 gangliosidosis, what we've done is essentially move the exact same number of injections that we're doing in mice into cats. So essentially they received four injections in a single procedure, naturally injecting a bit or larger amounts of vector. But what we found is that within a month, the entire brain had been supplied with enzyme. And again, so here you have the normal enzymatic activity um, in a cat. Here there is actually a little bit of a section that you can see that there is no enzymatic activity, and you can appreciate that enzyme within a month had distributed throughout the entire uh, brain of, the, of the, the cat. So if you could play the videos, that would be great. Thank you. So this, this model, and I'm sorry for those of you that have cats, I happen to have them as well, and this is a little heartbreaking to see the poor uh, cats like this. But they're born normal, and within two to three months, they start to develop symptoms, the disease progresses, and eventually they are unable to support the hind legs. You can appreciate the widened stance of the front legs as the mechanism for the, the cat to try to maintain balance. But eventually, by about eight to eight and a half months, uh, the cats have to be euthanized because no longer can support the, uh, the weight in the four uh, legs. If you could play the next video, please. So on the other hand, animals that are treated pre-symptomatically about six to eight weeks of age, uh, five years later they are perfectly normal. And actually yesterday I learned from my colleague that we still have to this day cats at eight years of age performing uh, perfectly normally. This is with four injections uh, done in these cats. So certainly it looks like this approach uh, in a large animal model has a dramatic therapeutic uh, effect that is worth considering the translation into uh, human. So the other disease that I work on is uh, Tay-Sachs or Senhoff disease. Um, I'm not going to go into the biochemistry here in too much detail, but the enzyme that is missing is actually heterodimer. Exosamine day is made by alpha subunit and a beta subunit. And so this first generation of approach that we started to implement following studies, seminal studies from our colleagues in England, um, Professor Tim Cox, is that 
we encoded vectors, two vectors, one encoding the alpha subunit and one encoding the beta subunit. And in fact, we took it through the same type of approach given our results in GM1 ganglicidosis that uh, these thalamic injections combined into deep cerebellar nuclei, and the results were exactly the same, which is great to know that, in fact, this is not just a particular property of uh, lysomal beta-gal, but, in fact, seems to be a property that is uh, shared across at least uh, two different enzymes. And here again, after an injection into the thalamus, you see the anterior-posterior distribution of the enzyme throughout the brain. This, of course, led to uh, a dramatic increase in survival, dose-dependent increase in survival. Untreated animals die at about four months of age, and we could push the survival out to uh, past, well past a year of age by increasing, uh, with increasing doses of treatment. So the part that, that is actually uh, quite interesting, naturally, our colleagues at Auburn University that we've worked with for many, many years have also an animal model of Sandhoff disease. And essentially, the biology that we've documented in mice uh, translates into two different cat models with the notion that, again, you have this uh, translation or this uh, distribution of the protein throughout the entire brain, anterior posterior, and in fact, also to the spinal cord. You can see here nicely the gray matter uh, with plenty of enzyme being distributed to the spinal cord. This had a, a very dramatic uh, change uh, in survival of the animals. And one of the things that it led us to learn is that, in fact, um, we treat the central ner nervous system aspect of the disease and other phenotypes that we've never found, because, of course, the animals died about four months of age, become apparent in peripheral organs as well. Uh, since we also have apparently a wealth of animal models, a tay sachs sheep, which of course the brain of a sheep is actually relatively large despite the fact that one wonders why, uh, that is 140 grams, I suppose they probably are, you know, zen-like and use all of that to uh, think about the meaning of the universe, but uh, anyway, don't appear uh, behaviorally. But the nice part about it is that, in fact, the same type of uh, distribution is observed in a much larger brain than either the mouse or the cat, suggesting that, in fact, uh, this may be an approach that could be translated into humans. And, in fact, that's uh, what we tried to do, or we started moving towards uh, in that direction. And after many years of experiments in mice, cats, and sheep, we were essentially ready to start a clinical trial and actually decided to perhaps the best and the worst decision I've made in my life, all at the same time in a single experiment, um, that just before the clinical trial, we thought that because this was the first time we were going to put in human and inject an AV into the thalamus, that we probably should test it in, in a few monkeys, not really a very large, again, academic environment. We really don't have the money to do hundreds of monkeys. So a couple of monkeys, you know, after three species, we were absolutely convinced that this was going to be perfectly safe. After all, it was safe in mice, cats, and monkeys. And what we found is that completely the opposite. In fact, at the doses that had been injected in mice, cats, and sheep, uh, it proved to be incredibly toxic. So this obviously was an eye-opening experience for us. And, you know, the description of the pathology says spongiosis. Anytime you hear spongiosis about the brain, that's a really, really bad sign. And in fact, you can appreciate it down here that really it's, uh, all the neurons in a very large area of the thalamus uh, were gone. And as I was telling you yesterday, or earlier, not yesterday, but I'm, I'm still half asleep. I should be looking at these as live streaming as well. Um, the, the fact of the matter is that um, the thalamus as being the relay of information. So what we found in these animals is that within actually a month, they essentially became disconnected from reality. Okay, so it was not terribly surprising that that would be the phenotype, obviously shocking that it actually happened. Now, one of the first things that came to mind is, of course, well, this is an immune response. And in fact, what we found is that there was plenty of areas here. This is eosinophilic material that we ended up showing that, in fact, is uh, enzyme being overexpressed in neurons still. And we express both subunits in the thalamus. And we end up showing with a, a vector that did not carry a transgene, that the response was not either to the capsid or to the genes themselves. Because one of the things that we did actually at this point, because of many papers that had been done before that used the human uh, subunits, and there's always the question, well, some of these immune responses we see are caused by an immune response to the transgenes. 
we decided to take that out of the equation and actually do experiments with the monkey subunits themselves. So we cloned them, made the vectors, did the injections, so we were pretty sure that in fact this would not be an immune response to the vector or, or to the transgenes. And in fact, here you can see that uh, many of the cells that are expressing the, the alpha subunit are in fact neurons. So uh, what we ended up uh, postulating is that in fact, unlike many other organs, uh, neurons really can withstand expression or overexpression up to a point. Um, this was a lesson that of course is a bit hard to, to learn when you're about to go into a clinical trial, but certainly one that is better to learn before you do it in patients and you learn it in an even harder way. But it's certainly, to us, this is what the opening shot of understanding that gene transfer to the CNS, one has to consider very carefully the potential impact that you might have uh, by overexpressing proteins. And while other organs, such as liver, if you overexpress a protein and the hepatocyte doesn't like it too much, you lose a couple of hepatocytes, it's unpleasant, necessarily your clinical trial, you know, your PI will be pulling hairs out that, you know, the liver enzymes are going up and all that, but it's not a big deal. A couple of weeks later, you'll be just fine because it regenerates. Well, the brain is a completely different story. Once you've lost, it's gone, and that's about it. So this has opened our, our mind to the fact that one should consider as a, as a source of toxicity, the trend gene itself and the expression levels, that, that unlike what we've encountered in the field that really has been extremely difficult to reach normal levels of, for instance, factor nine. Uh, in fact, the brain, you have to be a little bit more careful than that, that while you want to have this broad distribution of the gene, right, to treat every single cell or, or as many as we possibly can, you have to be cognizant of the fact that you have a cell that if it dies, it's gone. And not necessarily every gene can or should be expressed at extraordinarily high levels, unregulated levels. So in fact, we have a, a uh, not oral abstract presentation later that actually shows this very nicely that the subcellular localization of a protein, GFP in this case, can actually have very different outcomes uh, when it comes to, uh, to toxicity. And that's, I think, a lesson that we should take in terms of central nervous system and perhaps actually take that back to uh, signals that we observe in other organs as well. So uh, essentially with that, that notion, we've developed a second generation of vectors where we tune down expression. It has now proven safe, has gone through IND enabling studies, and essentially in advanced stage of planning uh, for phase one, two, which means that if you have any change or in your back pocket, you can drop it here for the clinical trial. Thank you very much for those of you that came in. Um, because obviously translation to a clinical trial is awfully expensive, and so the planning stages means we're trying to raise money for it. Um, it's a nice way to say it, I suppose. Um, so, oh, I went backwards. So obviously with the, the second stage of, spe of uh, the, the age of flight, I guess the discovery that AV9 uh, crosses the blood-brain barrier, like many of our other colleagues, certainly a systemic infusion is a lot less invasive, and certainly if the efficacy is there, a much more pleasant experience and cheaper to implement uh, in patients. So many, like many other of our colleagues in this field, we tested the ability to treat GM1 mice uh, through vascular delivery. And in fact, what we found is that we could, uh, not quite like what we've done before by intracranial injection, but we were able to restore enzymatic activity in the brain, about 10 to 20% of uh, normal activity, so a bit of a difference between males and females. It works actually better in females, but I think that's a, a mouse-specific effect. And in fact, what that result is an extension uh, in lifespan of the animals. And as more activity is found in the female brain, the survival is also longer. So as usual, and now you probably uh, see the pattern of our experiments, that we go from small animals into large animals. And of course, this is a great Photoshop picture. Those of you that, that actually know uh, cats, you would know that you'd be dead by now, and you, know, you would have lost a couple of fingers by now. So it's, this is actually one of those times that Photoshop is great, really. So, um, you know, the cats were treated at a relatively uh, low dose, I, I guess by today's standards, of 1.5 times E4, E13, and this was based on the mouse uh, experiments. And one of the things that, that we appreciate is that well, I wouldn't be telling the story if this hasn't worked, obviously. So uh, it actually worked even better than, than in mice, as a matter of fact. And this is looking at MRI 
uh, that is actually an outcome measure that can employ uh, nicely in clinical trials is that there is a loss, a characteristic loss of myelin uh, in this animal model. And what you can appreciate here is that a cat, you know, these cats are about eight to eight and a half months of age, and the fact that it's two years here already can tell that, in fact, it had a dramatic impact. And you can see that myelin is pretty well preserved, both uh, in the brain as well in the cerebellum. You can see these striations here that go away, and you can appreciate them here as well. So I, I have to... Uh, uh, so then in terms of, of biomarkers, in fact, uh, we can document that in CSF the enzymatic activity goes up. And in fact, very simple uh, biomarkers such as, or enzymes such as T and L, uh, LDH, you can actually use them to track uh, the therapeutic impact. And it correlates very nicely uh, with disease state where they both elevated and in therapeutic, in the animals that receive the therapy, it's in fact um, much better or actually brought back to normal. Glycosaminoglycans in urine respond as well to this therapy, which is not terribly surprising. And then I'll just show you very briefly. You could play the second video, uh, the one on the, there you go, they play both at the same time, much better actually. So you can see a cat at two years old really playing with the laser light, very much like what I'm doing to you following it here. Uh, the cat is also doing that quite nicely. My dog does that too. I didn't know dogs did that actually. But uh, anyway, so you can see a cat here, uh, pretty normal, um, behaving like any other cat would. And uh, so essentially this, by a single treatment, the effect in this large animal model is quite impressive actually. Um, so obviously we have started moving this uh, also to Tay-Sachs disease. Uh, we've engineered now a, a single vector that carries both subunits. Certainly one can understand that injecting two vectors simultaneously would certainly not be um, highly effective on when there is a dilution factor through the vasculature. We finally develop a single vector that carries both subunits. And we started with PHPB. All of you that are in this field now know PHPB and PHPEB. So we started with the easiest uh, vector that we were pretty certain would work, and then decided to test the AV9. And you know, it was quite surprising, actually, that even with AV9, we got a fantastic response. With one vector, we tested two different vector designs, and essentially in the top dose and the low dose, uh, most animals are uh, still alive today, especially in the high dose and the low dose of one particular design. They're all alive, and actually behaviorally, they all perform um, essentially the same as uh, normal animals while the untreated animals continue to, to go down in terms of performance. And biochemically, there is, here is the levels of GM2 ganglicide across the central nervous system. And as you would expect, there is a dramatic impact in GM2 ganglicide content in the brain. So essentially, everything uh, matches pretty well between survival, the perform behavioral performance, motor performance, and then obviously the biochemical correlate. So finally, in the last two minutes, you know, this is the, the beginning of the space age. You know, I, I think when you compare someone to Elon Musk, it's kind of cool, actually. And, you know, I think this is sort of the start of, of really uh, where we can be. And certainly it's incredibly exciting. I think the field, uh, really, when we saw PHPB, we certainly thought that this is, you know, this is it and that we could actually translate this. Unfortunately, it turns out that uh, the uh, PHPB, the properties across animal species are not maintained. So the, the enormous enhancement that has been uh, reproduced in tons of labs in C57 animals, in fact, quite a few other strains, as a matter of fact, as well, does not seem to translate uh, to other species. So that has been done now in monkeys been done in marmosets, in NHBs, you saw yesterday from Voyager, Jim Wilson also published an early paper showing pretty much the same thing. And our poster there, or our oral presentation shows that in cats, that in fact, it's no better than AV9. I mean, it performs about the same as AV9, maybe slightly better. Um, PHPEB is a further evolution of this, uh, but to me, actually, the, the, the importance of this really is Okay, fine, all our hopes were a little bit dashed, right, because all of us expected, okay, we're going to have the same properties and the future is here. But actually, I do think the future is very, very near because the importance of these papers is actually twofold, right? First of all, like in any human endeavor, when you know it's possible, everyone comes up with a thousand ways to do the same thing, and that's what progress he made, right? When the Wright brothers took flight, it showed that actually we can do it. And, you know, nowadays we can fly around the globe 
pretty certain we'll get there. Uh, only a few poor souls eventually sometimes don't, but it's extremely rare. Um, so once we know something is possible, that's the key first step, and this is where the, the brilliance of this paper actually is. But there is something else, actually. It's not just that, but it's how to do it. Because most, up till now, most capsids are based on, you know, you inject a capsid library that, you know, hopefully is randomized, as in enough spends, enough uh, variables or variants in the library. And up until then, all of us essentially went to the tissues, PCR amplified genomes that are resident in the tissue, and that's great and has generated some interesting capsids, but what does that, does th that does not tell you is whether they're functional, okay? The importance of this paper, the CREATE system that Ben came up with, and, you know, the CREATE 2 is an evolution of that, obviously, 2.0, is the fact that the capsids are no longer selected based on the fact that you're just tissue resident, but the fact that they're actually functional. And by combining a capsid library selection with a very, very smart way uh, using Cree to flip around a, uh, essentially a primer sequence, they're able to actually identify the capsids that successfully made it to the nucleus and therefore capsids that we actually care about. Because really in gene therapy, we don't really care if a capsid is tissue resident. What we care is a capsid that actually mediates the entire process through that big, huge black box that uh, Shannon uh, referred to, and it truly is a, a black box. Still a black box for AV9, still a black box for PHPB, uh, but certainly, you know, at some point we'll understand the mechanism. For now, I guess it's, uh, we can be happy about these results. And I'm certain that, in fact, given these principles that Ben has demonstrated so eloquently and so nice in the, nicely in this paper, that in fact we can figure out ways of making these new caps, new generation of capsids for CNS that work not only in mice, but across <coughs> species and ultimately in human, and really giving us the tools to not intervene only in lysosomal storage disease, but really having a good chance of intervening in Huntington's disease and other diseases that are global, and that in fact most cells need to be modified to achieve transformer results. So I think with that, I'll just leave here with the a very long list of people, and I'm sure mostly from my colleague Doug Martin at Auburn University, I have missed uh, quite a lot of people because it takes a, an army of people to do uh, experiments in large animal models. And our colleagues at Boston College as well, and of course all the funding agencies with, without which we couldn't do any of this work. And with that, um, I'll take questions. <clears throat> Okay, due to the time, I think we're just going to, I'll ask one question really quickly, uh, and that is, so I'm just curious about the, um, the difference you saw between species of overexpression using the mm -hmm. CBA promoter. Do you think that's a, an effect of the CBA promoter, its strength in different species, or the tolerability of overexpression in different species? Um, it could actually be a third factor, okay. is that the capsid actually enters uh, cells in the monkey at different rates. So these capsids were isolated from monkeys it is quite possible that actually the efficiency of transduction is a bit higher. Uh, the problem with all of this is that there is an empirical magical number of ex overexpression that neurons tolerate, but we have no idea what that number is. Um, so this is something to always take into consideration when designing a strategy, whether expression levels, you really want to reach extraordinarily high levels. With these new capsids, I think we enter a new stage where super high expression levels may no longer be necessary and perhaps the CBA promoter that has reigned up until now may not be the best choice of promoter to move on to the future. Thank you. Thank you.